This episode of Finding Demo Surf Fishing is being brought to you by DS Custom Tackle. DSCustomTackle.com is the website to go take a look at to get your hands on some outstanding gear for your surf fishing. You need floats? They got you covered. Hooks? Yep. Beads? Definitely. Uh, maybe you need your own rigs, different types of fishing. They got you covered, not just for the Florida area. They got you covered up and down the East Coast. Oh, yeah. Delaware team knows what they're doing. They've been doing really good things with good shipping and good customer service. DSCustomTackle.com. Go take a look. Get your order in today. Hey, everybody. Hope you're doing well wherever you are. It's been a good week. Hopefully the season has been good to you so far. We are approaching or where I guess we're in summer fishing. I mean, it is uh, it's getting hot. It's getting real. And uh, of course, we're right in the middle of the or we're at the beginning of hurricane season here in Florida. So we're about to deal with a bunch of fun stuff because that's what we do here in Florida. We deal with it. <laughs> uh, this week, we're uh, we're actually going local. We're just heading over to points point port. Port, P-O-R-T, Port St. Joe area. We're going down there. And we're going to be talking with Travis Lucas of Hometown Sharkers. Been pretty cool finding him on social. Uh, lots of different fish species, some really cool ones there. And we're going to get into his story and go from there. And we're going to continue on. So without further ado, good morning, sir. And welcome to the show. How's it going? Good it to be here. Good day so far. Has it hasn't been a bad one. I am not complaining at all. So you're out of the uh, PSJ area, so Port St. Joe, and down there on the peninsula. You got, you're real close to the old time border zone there. Um, and you get quite the different sets of fishery there, man. You guys got a unique one. Oh, yeah. it's uh, It can be pretty interesting, man. We get all the big sharks you can really think of, uh, big redfish, big black drum, flounder, uh, speckled trout, pretty, pr- pretty good variety, big, huge <laughs> At all kinds of nice stingrays uh i mean it's interesting if you want to get into the whole alligator tagging thing we got a huge alligator population it's uh gets pretty interesting most of the time <laughs> i bet it says one cool thing i love about florida and you know it, granted everybody's got their own little things but one thing i've learned with florida is you know you, you can go bass fishing in the morning hop on go get some alligator in the area and into the evening throughout the day you could be at the beach or if you want to get on the boat you can go out to the pier you can go off to the ledge and you just get after it there's so many great species and you know if you want to go after the monster you sent me a text the other night 13 footer huge shark beautiful shark in out and done you can we can do it almost all here oh yeah year round too we don't really have a down season uh for you pretty much just swap out species for different time of the year. Uh, summertime, we go out to the river sometimes and do the whole gar thing. Uh, we just got a, a alligator snapping turtle a couple weeks ago. I posted that on there too. Yeah. Uh, wintertime, or we get our summertime tigers, just like that big one we just caught, and hammers. Uh, the other night, we just got a nine and a half foot lemon off the pier. And then turn right around in the wintertime, and you got opportunities at dusky shards. Makos, you know, I mean, pretty much year round, you can stay pretty busy if uh, you're an angler or really any kind of wildlife thing you want to get into over here. Yeah, definitely got you covered. All right, man. So let's start at the very beginning for you here. Let's back it up. Tell us your story and what got you into fishing. All right. Uh, I'm about third generation. My grandpa did it. His dad did it. Uh, my Shoot, my mom did it. My uncles did it. My uncle used to run a shrimp boat and, uh, that's what they kind of did on their bat- pastime. They'd drop, drop a line and shark fish when they was waiting for the nighttime so they can run back out and troll for shrimp. And man, I kind of got into it there and went that and kind of went on my own route with it. Instead of on the boat, I kind of really got into the land-based stuff and bigger fish started getting caught, and bigger gear started getting got, and it just, <laughs> it's, it's an addiction, man. It went on from there. Yeah, it is and it's, it's like a steamrolling one too it doesn't just you know you can't just stop at one thing it's like oh damn it and i caught this okay i want to catch that again i need this and then i need this and then i need this <laughs> it's just never ending 
it's it's a learning process and uh I've, I've been doing it shoot most of my life pretty hot and heavy on there for probably the past 10 to 15 years pretty pretty full on and i tell people all the, that all the time i've been doing it for a lot of years and you still learn something every time you go out there definitely that's yeah, true what's your favorite thing about fishing uh man i've always been a adrenaline junkie man i like i like the big game stuff drag pulling the the thought of something catching something that could can eat you you're catching something that could dr- drag you to your last thing and it's just i don't know it's it's awesome just mm-hmm. and a lot of people say sh- shark is easy you know but to do shark successfully and consistently there's research that goes into it I- any average joe can go out cast out a line and maybe catch one good fish a year it takes somebody that actually does the research to put consistently good fish on the beach. Yeah, very much so. And you've been, I mean, you just proved right there with a third generation moving on from that. And you've been growing into your own world there and catching great ones and continuing on. Uh, let's play into that. Actually. What, what can you share a memorable surf fishing story, including any kind of unexpected catches or challenging fishing situations? Man, I, I would have to say the, the most mind-boggling one was actually here recently with that uh that big short fin mako. The location that we had got it from has never had a recorded mako landed from the beach ever. And uh, man, we went out there. We did an expedition-style trip. We uh, it's a location we can drive down on the beach, so we wasn't by really anybody. And we did an ex- expedition-style trip. We had already landed quite a few good fish. It was our last night there. Uh, I had caught a black tip in the surf. and It was a nice one. I don't know, probably six and a half foot, solid, solid black tip. And we dispatched it, and I ran it out right there at sundown as a fresh bait. And it was a big bait, pretty, uh, pretty much the whole torso section of about a six, six and a half foot black tip. And I sent it out on a a Makari 130 and we went on about our day you know we was expecting you know big tigers stuff like that for winter time stuff and we uh we was actually on our sleep shift and i i woke up to the Makaira screaming just to just scream and sound like a boat ran into it and uh we got over there uh, got the rest of the crew up i harness up we're ready to go and i said hook into it and at the initial hook set, it was a lot of weight. We were taking a big tiger, and then it it woke up. It was like I grabbed the back of a boat, <laughs> going going in the opposite direction. And uh, at that point, we knew it was going to be something cool. Uh, we was kind of thinking a big hammer because we had caught a about a thirteen foot hammer the weekend before, so we was thinking another cold cold water hammer. We fought it for a while, and then uh, she started jumping. And we we realized it was going to be something, something special. And uh, we still didn't know 100% what it was yet. And uh, we got the actual video. I think I sent it to you of uh, it coming up on the surf and the wave reciting off of it. And initial thought, uh, yeah, the initial side of it, we thought it was a great white because she was so girthy. She was huge. And then once the the light hit it, we'd seen that beautiful purple blue shimmer off of her. We we knew it was it was a giant a giant mako, and uh, that that right there, man. I'll, to this day, that that's probably been the most memorable kind of punch in the face situation right there, man. That that was a beautiful shark, and uh, it was it was awesome. It was is a one one of the most memorable experiences I'd, I'd have to say that I, of any any catch that I've had so far. Dude, that's nice. Yeah, that was a hell of a catch. Good job. Really good job. Uh, you know, you said something piece there and unexpected in uh, this year, I'd say, yeah, actually probably for 2024, I have learned a lot more about sharks uh, than I have in my previous years of podcasting. Um, I've had some pretty cool guests on um, that have really kind of, kind of helped me feel a little bit smarter about like, okay, I mean, granted, I will not, I'm not a shark guy. I won't go by the gear. I have that. I, that's not my, that's not my land of happy. But it was very interesting to hear the stories and uh, 
one in particular being Captain Chip up in South Carolina was talking about the the shark he caught, Lee Beth. Uh, the great white that he caught had gone down, gone down, come up, hung out in the Gulf, got real close to us, real close to us, and then peaked off. And um, a couple other people I was talking about sharking said, shark activity is up and it is becoming more erratic and unexpected. We're seeing different species that we weren't seeing before coming closer, chasing bait um, with so many things changing. Uh, but it has been really, really cool to see what your community is doing and the responsible angle, you know, the responsible, responsible sharkers. There we go. Put my words in there, right. Uh, are doing such great things with the community for the research. It's impressive, man. Y'all are really finding out some new things and helping scientists get an idea of what's going on in the world. Oh yeah, it's a uh, it's great, man. And that that's with any really any kind of fishing, man. That's something we talked about earlier. You can always you're, there's always room to learn. Stuff's always changing. You know, stuff happens. You might figure out something by accident that ended up working great, and then now now you've got a new uh, page in your arsenal on how to target certain stuff. I mean. That, that, that's one of the cool things about fishing, man. No matter how much you know, there's always going to be something else you can figure out. Definitely. Absolutely true. All right, so let's talk about some t uh, fishing tips, tricks, and knowledge here. Let, let's move into that. How do you plan your personal fishing trip days? Personal fishing trip days. Uh, man, I'll go through, check weather reports. I'm a, I'm a big, I don't know, uh, researched guy I, i'll look at the wind direction i'll look at current direction tide charts and kind of fit, pick my spot out of that which way is the wind blowing at what part of the peninsula what area is going to have the best tide difference i will do that and then make some fresh leaders go over all my gear uh i'm a big fresh bait guy i'm if i'm not shark fishing chances are i'm chasing bait and uh see what's in the area I got what a, a lot of my friends call my black book. I log all my information from all my catches, what bait I use, what time of the year, what time of day I'm catching. And I build, I build up a pretty much a reference book of all, all, all the knowledge that I gather between the, the moon phases. And so once I pre-plan for a trip, that's what I look at. I'll check the wind, wind, I check, check the tide charts, check the moon phase and, I'll pick my location of where I want to go set up based on all that and whatever position on the beach. Cause out here on the peninsula, no matter where the wind's blowing, you can always find a position of the beach. That's going to have the wind in your favor. So that's kind of where I base my trips off of. Yeah. You guys have an advantage, dude. I, I will give you, you guys definitely have a little sneaky on there. Hey, I don't like it. Hey, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go over here to the West. Eh, it's not so good in the West. You know what? I'm going to go to the East. Ah, you know what? I'm going right to the tip. You guys got a little love there. Oh yeah. It, it's uh, it definitely helps out. It makes it where uh, you can always do some kind of fishing. You can always get away, get away from the surf in some, some way, shape or form. Yeah. So you do sharking. I know that. Yeah, uh, you and like you said earlier, you do all types of fishing. Is there any type for you that like this is my jam? That's what I prefer. Oh, the the big game stuff, man. Big game land base. That is that is my calling. That's what I love. Uh, I I love chasing these big predatory fish, man. A lot of people give them a bad rap, but they're little little water puppies, man. I mean, just just, and just like your everyday dog. Accidents happen. I mean, things happen, but. Yeah, I, that's what I like the big, the big toothy, the big toothy stuff that people always, you know, act, act like they're afraid of. And uh, we get people come up to us sometime, like uh, we we just caught that big tiger, and uh, we just drove drove down the beach, you know, and uh, got away from the majority of the people. And we, you know, people still pull up, you know, they see you hooked up on a big rod and reel and hear drag screaming, you're going to draw a crowd, or at least people coming by and stopping and. People stopped and watched, and uh, we like to educate. That's one of my my big things on the Hometown Sharkers page, just like on my Facebook. I'm always doing a, da a daily dose of fishing, usually in the morning, and then uh, like uh, fun fun facts. And I'll do a, a species that we've caught or been in contact with, and I'll do a bunch of fun facts on it, lifespan, migration patterns, uh, just little fun facts and tips about them. And 
uh, I'm big on the educational stuff, man. So I love people coming out and asking what we're doing and shoot, I, I'm fighting the fish and educating them while we're pulling the shark up. And uh, I don't know. I like getting people involved, man. And I think that's kind of my big calling is, I guess the biology side of it, teaching people something and allowing people to see something that most people that's not in this and shoot, even some people that do do this go lifetimes and not being able to see. I, I've talked to several people in my area that, I mean, tigers are known for the panhandle, but we always call it the tiger curse. You know, up until you catch your first tiger, you're never going to see a tiger. Yeah. And uh, we, I, I've been, uh, I've been lucky enough, man. We've caught, we've caught quite a few. I think uh, we, we average, I don't know, in between ten and thirteen fish over ten foot a year. Thirteen being my most, and that, that's big numbers for. Uh, I say little guys. A lot of people say we're bigger than what we are, but I don't know. I feel like we're pr still pretty small as far as the big picture of it. And I don't know. I feel like 13 fish over 10 foot a year is pre pretty good numbers, how I feel. And I, I, I look at, I'm trying to up them <laughs> as much as I can. And so being able to educate people on them type of situations, it's, it's pretty awesome. You get people coming up and, again, unless you actually do this, not many people can say that they've been able to be hands on with a animal over 10 foot. Yeah, that is very, very, very true. Yeah. It, yeah. Some of the, uh, as I'm rambling here, uh, I, I was just kind of thinking about something that Blaine and Dylan had told me, uh, the guys from coastal worldwide, the, you know, they're like Blaine was chasing that one for a long time. And he's like, you just always chase it, man. And then it's like, yes, we got this. And it's all an, an educational and a uh, fun experience the, uh, the entire time you're out there. So I, I love that. You're also sharing the stoke with that and sharing in the knowledge with people. It's huge. So we talked about the fishing trip. Now let's talk about spot selection. Uh, what are you looking for to pick your spot to fish? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, like a little bit, we touched on earlier. Uh, I'll check the wind direction and, uh, tides are really a big big thing for me uh i'll kind of look at the area and depending where it's at you know some places there's some days where we might have two tide changes in a day and then there's sometimes we'll have one big swing and so i'll check the tide check the wind direction and uh that that's pre pretty well what i base off of where i'm gonna go i'll get on there i got an app that tells me wind direction and stuff like that and i'll, I'll be, i base a lot off of that and then go from there I got certain wind patterns that I like to look for for certain fish. Yeah. <laughs> Quite a few people have a specific one they really love. So that's good stuff. Um, so when it comes to sharks, I get the piece. You, you got to play different. Uh, you you got to play zones in a way. I mean, you've got different drops for all those. Uh, and I know with like just regular cast, you know, surf fishing as we normally do for whiting, palm, Spanish, all that fun stuff, you're playing the same game when it comes to drops. What is it something you look for when you're doing your drops out there for fishing? Uh, we pat we paddle most of our baits out. So, I mean, different species of sharks like different things. Uh, tigers are known to be your big, lazy, you know, dumpsters of the sea. And so while I'm paddling out there, a lot of times you might find a cross current, which is just a random, almost like a horizontal riptide that's parallel to the beach. You might be paddling straight out and then you'll randomly look back and you've shifted, but you've kept the same direction. A lot of times that'd be a cross current. And I've learned big tigers, they're lazy. So they'll get into them cross currents and just kind of ride them and eat whatever they find. So we like to look for cross currents for when we're, uh, going for our big tigers or uh, any kind of deviation of the water. If you might find a uh, random oil slick, usually big big fish will throw an oil slick. If you see an oil slick, it could be anywhere from a shark swimming down deep or a big school of jacks that might have came through. Any Most of your big fish will throw an oil slick, which is just a, like a slick film over the top of the water. And then that right there, it could have been something feeding, which is a good sign or like I said, a school of jacks that might have came through deep where you might not have seen the surface disruption on the surface of the water, but you'll see that oil slick from that bait right there. And so that just little stuff like that. Uh, if we see anything thinning or any kind of bait popping, rays jumping. jumping, we'll just look for any, any kind of life while we're out there on the kayak. 
and that's that's where we'll like to drop. That's smart. Yeah, the the visual clues are huge, and I think they're often overlooked in our world of surf fishing. Uh, I mean, it's birds are one thing. Birds, yeah, birds are cheater. You know, I can tell what the birds are doing. I'm like, oh, okay, I know what's up with. But that oil slick, that is one that people I think go, well, why is it like that? I'm like, oh, there's a disturbance right there that you need to get a line near. Yeah, yeah, I've noticed that a lot. A lot of people don't really pay attention to that side of it, but every every little detail, man, it it all makes a difference. It, and again, you don't know 100% what's throwing that oil slick up. It could have been a shark that just ate something, or it could have been a jack, some jacks that came through. You know, just most of your big fish they do put off some nastiness. I've noticed if you ever get into big shark fishing and you're reeling up a big shark. That's something you can look for also. While you're fighting it and it's getting close, you can tell where the shark is because he's going to throw up an oil slick. You're going to see wherever that shark is, you're going to see a nice slick film over the top of the surface where that, that shark is throwing an oil slick. Yeah, it's weird how that happens. Uh, well, it's been 20 minutes, so let's go ahead and knock out a bait check real quick. It is your first bait check of the episode. Hopefully you've caught a bunch of fish by now. And if you haven't, reel it in. Double check that line. Make sure you got good bait on there. Probably a good time to re-top uh, it off. Never hurts. Every 20, 20 to 30 minutes, always a good time to do a bait check when you're out there at the surf. Uh, this bait check is being brought to you by the Kids Can Fish Foundation. Kidscanfish.net is the website to take a look at to see all the cool things that they're doing for this community. They take kids out and do these camps and show them how to throw cast nets, surf fish, inshore fish, how to use the rod and reel and all the, all rod and reel and all the gear. And and then on the end of it, the kids get to take all the gear home. That's theirs. They are, they got it for free. And that's all thanks to your donations that make this happen. They've got their big tournament coming up in October. The annual Kids Can Fish uh, St. Simon's Island Running of the Bulls uh, up there in Georgia. I'll be there. It's going to be really exciting. I'm always That's a fun one. they got a lots of cool raffles, lots of fun things on there. And you can also ben, or you can support them through buying the cast net from Pro Mar Ahi. There's one support way. Or you can do right through the website and you can get into kidscanfish.net and there's a donate button on there they are a charitable don uh, they are a 5013c i think i'm saying that right uh charity so it's on there it's all tax deductible all the cool things so lots of good stuff help them out go to helping a kid go fishing and learn more so now that we played into that one we're talking about those um Let's talk about into uh, the moon phases, tides, and that influence because you you touched on it there. So when you're looking at moons, because my least favorite's a full for some reason, and only because they eat all at night. Um, but again, I'm not sharking. What have you found with uh, certain tides and moon phases that are advantageous, and other ones that are just that's just not a good time to go? Uh, I mean, like you said, full moons, man. Full moons are a hit and miss. I've got a love-hate relationship with full moons. You're either going to catch or you're not going to catch. There's no in-between. The full moon, it's, I don't know, it's a weird time. Me personally, I like a half moon. Half moon's been been one of my favorites. And there's also an old, an old little, I guess, wives tale you could say about it. Most of your half moons, you're either going to be kind of up or kind of over if the it's tip if you get one that's kind of tipped over, it looks like you're dumping it. And there's old wise tell meaning a slanted moon that's dumping fish into the ocean. So a slanted moon, ten, you tend to get more bites. There's there's some there's some facts that goes with that little wise tail. I've had some very <laughs> and uh, that's what it looks like when your crescent is off to the side and your your half moon is kind of sideways. It, that's what it looks like. It looks like you're dumping something out and it. Uh, no, was it? Was it? Oh, right after a full moon. Yeah. And then, uh, right again, right after a full moon tends to be good. I like right after a full moon. Uh, again, uh, right on a full moon, man, I've not had a whole lot of luck. And then sometimes I've had good luck. But there's really no in between. You're either going to go out there and skunk and hate yourself for going out there. Or you're going to do great. There's... There's not really any mediocre trips on a full moon. You either do it or you don't. For me personally, I know some people that love and will chase after the full moon. And again, that's something that we touched on base earlier. It's very locational. What's good for me might not be good for them. Uh, yeah, the pan, the panhandle, 
compared to the East Coast. Good gaps for me might be bad gaps for them because they're on a different side of Florida. So that's that's something you got to look at for different areas. Different areas do better at different time frames and time, time of years. But as far as like a rough idea, I'd say my favorite moon phase will be right after the full moon. Okay. Yeah, I like that. Good call. Uh, and you do a lot of night fishing, obviously, for reasons on that. Uh, so what would you say are some effective strategies for surf fishing at night, and what safety precautions should angler take during the nighttime fishing? Uh, nighttime fishing, just be safe. Have a game plan. Uh, prep is everything. Uh, lights. Lights are huge when you're night fishing. Between taking baits out and being able to handle a big fish in the surf, if you don't go out there with lights, you're out there with something that could potentially hurt you <laughs> and not being able to really see what's going on. So lights, yeah, lights, lights are a huge ordeal. We'll go out there with a uh, headlamps, Q beams. I got a 20 volt battery powered light that uh, is on a stand. Once we're fighting and get it up close, we'll flip it on and let it to surf. That way you can get eyes on before we go out there and, put ourselves in, dam in danger, you know? So uh, lights are a huge thing. And having a game plan. Everybody's got a job when you're out there. Uh, well, yes, we're out there for fun. But again, the, the danger factor is there. So every everybody has their task. We got a guy that's going to go out there and get on leader. A guy that's going to get on the tail. Once, once they get in control of the shark, if I'm catching it personally, I'll rack up my rod, drop my drag down a little bit, and while they're grabbing the tail and maintaining it, I'm running down there with the D-hooker. So by the time I get down there with the D-hooker, they've already got the head open and ready to go. I posted a lot of videos of us D-hooking them. And, I mean, it's all quick, efficient, as fast as possible. Everybody's got a job. Like I said, they one guy's on the tail, one guy's on the leader. Once I rack up, he's grabbing the head, picking the head up. I'm running down there with bolt cutters and a D-hooker. If I can yank it out with my hand to the D-hooker, that's bolt what we cutter. go for first. Bolt, bolt cutters, or if it if it takes, I usually do two to three attempts. If by the third attempt it don't pop out, we go straight to cutting it. It's easy to replace the hook. I'm not trying to, you know, kill a fish. And we've, we've done good. good. I've, I've not lost a fish yet. So we've got our, our little routine pretty pretty down pat i'm uh i'm big on karma man if you if you treat what you're going for right then it's gonna treat you right and i feel like that's one of the reasons why we've had such good look at luck at what we do you treat everything with respect and it, it comes it comes back for you nice very good and yeah and getting that fish back out like you said and very important get them out quick so they live yeah it's, it's one of those hard ones uh, so you've talked about uh, the night one. Let, let's talk about baits. So different species like different things. Like you said, the trash can of the ocean likes to eat a certain way. You know, sandbars and lemons. Sure, they all love sharks. And, you know, some things just like other things more. Certain sharks really love bonita. Certain ones love cow nose ray. Uh, I know that that one kind of comes into that. So what would you say are some effective uh, bait or lure choices when you're playing around for surf and shark fishing that you have found to be successful? Uh, me personally, uh, I'd have to say my favorite bait to run would have to be blunt nose stingray. And they're a bigger species of ray, actually kind of newer for our area up until the past two years, I'd never seen one before. And then the past two years, we've caught quite a few of them. And uh, they've, they've produced very, very well for me. Blunt Nose Ray has done done great. Uh, I actually got my personal best one last year. It was about 155 pounds. Huge stingray. And they're su a super unique ray. They At first glance, a lot of people would misidentify them. They look a lot like a like a southern stingray but when you look at the tail of a southern stingray it's got that whip shape how it's so like rounded it goes down long it's a real smooth tail besides obviously your barbs and uh the difference between that and a blunt nose a blunt nail a blunt nose ray actually falls into a paddle tail species 
And if you actually look at the tail, they their tail is built like a a boat paddle. It's got the rounder in the middle, and then it's got bl a black fin across the top and a black fin across the bottom. And instead of like a southern stingray with the barbs kind of farther back, closer to the base of the tail, a blunt nose, the barb is more towards the end of the tail, almost like a almost like a scorpion. Not quite to the tip of it, but it's a lot further down the tail than on the base. And I'd have to say blunt nose ray, it's 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 produced some very, very good fish for me since we've started catching them. And again, fresh bait's the best bait. I'm a huge ray guy. Uh, I like running Jack Crevel. I've had luck with fresh Jack Crevel. Uh, and again, if we're talking about as far as surf fishing, I like topwater, big poppers. Uh, I'll usually put a little bit of wire on it, you know, just in case, because sharks, sharks will smoke a popper. And it's it's a pretty pretty fun experience catching sharks on topwater. It's, uh, it's definitely a blast. And then... Top water, I mean, you get in everything on the surf. Jacks are hit a top water, big redfish, uh, sharks, I mean, big uh, speckled trout. There's a lot, a lot of stuff you can get in with the top water. And again, well, water condition plays a big part on that. You don't want to be in super rough or a lot of surf chop throwing a popper. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't like to, you can't get that good spray when you're in two foot of, uh, and two foot waves. <laughs> you can't get that pull you want. But heck yeah. But oh. Gear's got a big play in that too. Uh, I've, been, I've been teamed up with a Reaction Tackle as a sponsor for quite a few years now. And uh, I have to say, man, I've done, I've done great with their stuff. And uh, a lot of people kind of shy from it because I guess it is, it's a, it's a cheaper, cheaper line base, but uh, I've done, I've done really great with it, and uh, they make sixteen strand hollow cord. It's a, it's a little bit thicker, but man, that stuff. Uh, like I tell everybody else, I post what I catch. Everybody sees what I catch, and I use them one hundred percent of the time. They're, they're great. It's a great, and cheaper than a lot of your competitors. Okay. It's a good reaction tackle. Got that one. Uh, and that'll be marked back, everybody. You guys can take a look at that. So now that we're talking about that, you, you bring me into the perfect part here. What are the essential gear and tackle needs for that kind of successful trip out there? And how can anglers that are looking to get into this choose the right gear for that? Uh, Man, as far as shark fishing, drag output and uh, line capacity is going to be your main your main looks. I, I love Makairas. The Okumas is my, that's my brand. That's what I like. Again, different strokes for different folks. But, uh, but uh, I love my Makairas, man. They do great. Uh, and again, it goes, that goes on location, location wise, man. If, if you're fishing an area that's known for big fish, you're not going to want to go out there with a 30 wide or even a 50 wide. Like on the East Coast, they're known for their big hammers. So I, I wouldn't suggest somebody to go get a Squall 50 and go drop a chunk of Stingray on the East Coast because then you're either, one, you're going to get spooled, two, you're going to damage your gear, or three, being the most important, you're going to wind up with a dead a dead fish on your hands. And so it's very very locational. If you do a lot of bay fishing and you're, you're – you, you know you're going to get bulls or tippers or lemon sharks and smaller stuff like that. Yeah, there's no reason in going and dropping $1,000 on a 130. But, again, if you're South Florida, East Coast, you know, the panhandle, like you, I, don't, I wouldn't suggest going and getting a 50 wide or a 30 wide. So that's a very big locational side <laughs> thing, but. If you're fishing somewhere where you're known for black tips and bulls, I mean, big spin gear. Go get a 8,000 to a 10.5 uh, spin rod or a 50 wide that's going to make your black tips, bull sharks, lemon sharks, spinners even, make it fun. You're not want to go out there. You're not want to go go out there with a 130 if you're catching only four foot, five foot sharks. For I mean, one, you're overpowering it. Two, you're not gonna get to enjoy it. You're just gonna drag the fish in. There's not. It's not gonna pull no string. Like on my 130, we still hook smaller stuff on it sometimes. Uh, 
we pulled up like a five foot bull shark on it the other night. Never even knew it was there. Grilled it. All the way <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My wife reeled it in. Never, never even knew it was there. Got it all the way up into the surf and then seen it. And was like, Oh, look, we got a shark on here and went and de-hooked it and let it swim back off. Never even knew it was there. So, uh, it's got it really based on what you're targeting. If you're targeting, Sharks between that three to six foot mark, a big spin rod even. And if you're first starting out, spin rod would probably be your best bet. Get get on a couple of smaller sharks right there in the surf. That way you get comfortable handling them. Like if you're just getting into shark fishing, it's not good for you or the fish for you to hook a 10 to 13 foot animal your first time ever putting your hands on, on a shark like that. One, that you're putting yourself at danger. You're putting ongoers in danger if there uh, there's people out there and you're putting that shark in danger like if you have zero experience i'm dealing with it i've seen a lot of people that look at us like we're crazy when we're out there chest deep in the water with a 10 plus foot animal like if you're not somebody that does this on a regular basis you're not gonna be comfortable make swimming that shark out making sure it swims off great yeah Definitely on that one for sure. Nicely done. So you definitely travel a lot and then you brought up a good thing when you're talking about the East coast, the panhandle and different parts of Florida. What do you do when you go fishing in a new place before you put lines in the water? Uh, pretty much same thing as I do here. I mean, routinely check, check everything, find a good spot. That's going to be away from people for the best part. Uh, check the surf, check the winds, check the tides. And Maybe do a little bit of recon, check around and see what baits baits around. You want to base base what you're bringing to drop for bait by what other people are catching around the area. <laughs> Matching the hatch is a huge ordeal. If you got an area that jacks aren't known for, and you go drop a jack, you're putting a bait down in there that your fish aren't eating. So there's a good chance it's not going to get ate where it might work good in your area. If they're, they don't have a routine population of jacks, you're going to be a lot less likely to get ate by it. Now, if you go somewhere where the cow knows are full-fledged uh, coming through in their big schools, and, you know, if you drop a cow nose, that's something that the, sh the sharks are already feeding on. So you got a lot higher percentage of a shark seeing it and be like, oh, cow nose, and eat it. So, I mean, I'm a big prep guy, man. I like, I like looking at the little details before I go out there and fish. But, again, we're running a lot of big gear, so – it's a lot of work doing what we do. So we do whatever we can to put the odds in our favor to produce something that makes it worth our time of doing it. For sure. How do you just attack or how do you adjust your tactics for fishing when the bite isn't on fire? Uh, a lot, a lot of times it's the leader, leader size, uh, bait change. So uh, some days you can go out there and soak one bait for 12 hours and it get picked up on that 12, 12th hour. You know, it's just if one bait ain't picking up, we might swap our baits around, do more consistent bait changes or or like uh, our leaders. Like I'll run several different types of leaders that I make. And uh, also Adam Williams with uh, Williams Top Notch Tackle. He does a great a great job making leaders. I get my twelve hundred pound leaders from him. And again, the leader size makes a huge, huge difference. So if we're going somewhere that's got a, a lot cleaner water, uh, just like you're offshore fishing and stuff like that, fish get leader shy. So where we might start off with a 1,200-pound leader for our big stuff, if there seems to be no action on it, I might drop to my 800-pound leader. Sharks, just like any other animal, if they see a hook and they're not that hungry, they're going to be less likely to eat it. So sometimes I'll run my 1,200 pound leader with a 24 all hook and a big old bait. If we're not getting no action on it, I might drop to my 800 pound leader with a 20 all hook. And sometimes that fixes it. There might be sharks in the area. I mean, it's the ocean. There's always sharks there. But they might see your leader line or they might see your hook and be like, ah, not today. And so you have a little bit smaller gauge leader with a 20 all hook. And that might make all the difference. They, you might get picked up eight times while everybody else is not catching nothing. We've had trips like that before where depth drop might have to change. Uh, I went out with a few buddies where I catch 
eight sharks and them not catch nothing. But and the only difference be they might be running a twelve hundred pound leader and I'm running an eight hundred pound leader. I mean, leader leader size makes a huge difference. You know, people, you talk about that and sharking is huge in our, and in the regular surf fishing. I think it's an overlooked thing is leader size makes a difference. And, you know, you, you don't always need certain amounts. You don't always need the heavy poundage. Sometimes the lighter stuff works out a lot better for you. So nicely put. Um, you mentioned this one earlier, and this kind of ties back in with it. Seasons. We, we have, I mean, we've either got summer or winter here. Um, <laughs> it seems depending on who you talk to, but seasons, seasonal fishing here is a real thing. So what have you noticed when it comes to different types of seasons, the fishing, uh, the fishing area? Uh, really, it just comes to what's migrating through the area. Like, you know, fall, you get your drums and your redfish coming in for the most part. Uh, spring, they're coming in. So just kind of goes with what we were talking about before matching the hatch if uh, the redfish are running and this is speaking on shark if the redfish are running again this is very different on areas some areas you can't do this some areas you can on your sports fish your redfish and stuff like that some areas you're not allowed to run them as bait over here you can but you got to look in your local laws here you can run them but you have to run it intact so if like you fillet it, you have to keep the entire carcass. You can't just dock it off and run just the head. You have to leave the whole carcass. That way if you are stopped, they can check it, make sure it's a legal, keepable fish. Some places you can't even do that, and it's against against the FWC rules or whatever your wildlife management is in your area. They don't allow it at all. But uh, seasonal, again, it goes with bait running. If you're wanting to get on redfish or big black drum, spring and fall is a great time. Uh, spring into uh, early summer, your jacks are coming through, your chippers. Uh, we get a pretty good winter season, man. Winter season, a lot of your smaller surf fish die out. Uh, now, whenever I say die out, I don't mean they die. They push offshore, but your bite slows down. But you can go out there and you can cast out crab for big big black drum big redfish even or push intercoastal wise and that's where most of your speckled trouts your redfish and stuff like that pushes up your intercoastal stuff during the winter time so if you got a nice you know non-landlocked river system a lot of people don't think about it but you can push up in the rivers and get your redfish get your speckled trout that's a that's the type of fishing a lot of people don't look into because a lot of people think of Redfish and stuff is saltwater fish, speckled trout, saltwater fish. But don't realize during your winter time they push inland, and you can go inland and throw a popper and something like you would in saltwater, and get your redfish, get your tarpon, uh, get your black drum, get your trout, and a lot of your bigger saltwater species that everybody packs up their gear for the winter time and gives up on fishing. Like you're losing such such a big, uh, I guess undercut fishery is your wintertime inshore fishing because all, all your all your big saltwater stuff that you would originally go for on your surf side you find an intercoastal or a, a non-landlocked river system and you can push up in there and probably have one of the best fishing experiences of your life with your trout and redfish and black drum and a lot of a lot of stuff here i've no, i have noticed a lot of people pack their stuff up during the winter time so you don't have to do that just figure out figure out your other fisheries and you can fish year round yeah definitely oh what are you would you say are some of the top surf fishing mistakes to avoid and how can anglers continuously improve their skills and knowledge uh getting stuck in your ways man i think is the big one getting having your mindset on doing stuff one way and holding to that one way man the little little bitty changes can make all the difference uh like so just like what we talked about earlier with the shark fishing you don't matter how long you've done this there's always something you can learn uh again changing leader size uh changing baits you might have your one bait that you're hooked on man and it just something as small as changing from a paddle tail to a fluke might be all, might be all the difference uh that's i think that one of the biggest mistakes man getting getting stuck in your ways and not being open-minded to try something different. You might be all about live shrimp, 
or a Carolina rig. And today you might be able to flatline a pinfish and might catch your PB that you've been looking for all because that one little change instead of Carolina rigging a live shrimp, flatlining that one pinfish, you might, it might make all the difference. But yeah. I think that's the biggest thing, man, being stuck, being stuck in the, in what you think is going to work. Them little bitty changes might, might make or break the trip. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy to get stuck in your ways. That's for dang sure. Uh, now we're at 45 minutes, man. It's just flying right along. So now we're time. We're due for another bait check. And then we're actually going to move into here. Let's start, we're going to talk about the social media world that you're running in. So let's get this knocked out real quick. This is your second bait check of the episode. And man, it is a good time. Hopefully you still got a bunch of fish going and everything's rocking really well for you. This bait check is being brought to you by the sinker guy. Oh yeah. Sinkerguy.com. Great website. Cause the chips got you covered. He's got a bunch of things in the sinker guy garage. He's got the Sputniks all covered different weights and sizes all day. No problem. Hooks, rigs, gear, all of it all set. If you need scissors, uh, pliers, oh, I don't know hooking tools for your hooks he's got all of that so lots of good stuff there at the sinkerguy.com go take a look get your order in today you will not be sorry that's for sure all right now that we've played into that let's talk into the social media world so you guys you run into with uh when we didn't say it from the start and i apologize hometown sharkers and so let's talk about that what is hometown sharkers and how did you guys get started well hometown sharkers i, I started it uh quite a few years ago and it just started off as, you know, kind of just a big game fishing thing, man. It was here locally. That's why it's hometown, hometown Sharkers is what we started off as. And it was just something that nobody in my general area, and I'm, I'm out of the Forgotten Coast, so you see a lot of people in Navarre and Pensacola that get into the big game stuff. Over here, it was really a, a fishery that no, no one's really touched base on. And again, we've done it for a while, and like like i said third third generation and there's people that even come out of town here just for regular fishing your red fish your surf fishing and stuff like that and uh i kind of got into it and like i said my family's done it for a while but it was a lot of like boat stuff wise and like they'd get into their big spin stuff or like bring up like the old school senators man the old 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 school stuff and so as my family got older, they kind of slacked off on it. And, uh, I didn't, man. I, I kind of dove head first into it <laughs> and, uh, uh, gear got bigger. The fish got bigger. And then, uh, we did charters for a while. I did charters. I don't know, two, three years and loved it for what it was, you know, it was a blast. Uh, and it just kind of wasn't what I was looking for. You know, most people, when they go into a charter, they're looking to land something. So, obviously, I'm dropping my gear size, and we're going for what I call uh, pastime fish. So, something where your tippers, your black tips, uh, black nose, bull shark, stuff like that, that you can pretty much guarantee you're going to catch. You use smaller gear, smaller hooks, smaller baits, you know. Clients love it, and every once in a while, you might hook into a big one fishing that way and it just wasn't my calling i like i like going for the larger larger stuff your stuff that's gonna make you earn it the stuff that you when you lose it you kind of contemplate yourself for a little while and it makes you want to figure out what did i do wrong what can i do to make it to where that don't happen it kind of goes again with the knowledge I, I i'm big on the knowledge of it i enjoy the biology backside of it logging information stuff like that and tagging we, we tag for noah doing this also and uh then it kind of evolved into more of a team a team thing once that stopped i got i got a few guys that i fish with on a pretty pretty consistent level uh again uh dan we've uh, linked up with him here recently and fished with him a lot he runs a uh, kernan land bay shark fishing he's heavy into the charter stuff out of south carolina uh ben bragner uh Joshua Smith fishes with us a lot. Uh, Will Harrison. And we've kind of just uh, 
accumulated a few guys, which is awesome because no, all of us fish different fisheries. Dan's from South Carolina. Ben's from Gainesville. Will's from Alabama. Josh is from Georgia. So it's it's nice to combine all these outside fisheries. And so we get to bounce around a little bit. And it's just it's nice having all this outside knowledge all combined into one. And it, it, it helps, man. We, we produce quite a bit. And so we quit doing the charters. We've do we've done quite a few charity side of things. Uh, we do, we've taken, uh, people from our military. We support our military. Uh, we've done a couple free trips for them. Them hit us up and, uh, just stuff that we, we don't make nothing off of. It's just take, taking them out there to get, show them a good time, get, getting more people the knowledge and experience of what we do is huge. Like I said, I, I'm huge on the educational side of it. Uh, we've done a couple like ill people, sick, sickness related situations where we've came, took them out and their families out to show them a good time while their, their health is degenerating. And uh, so we're huge. You were huge on that, that side of things. And yeah, so pretty, pretty much now we're, we're just a team of, like-minded individuals that just love this and got the kind of the same aspect on it. We do tournaments. We actually got a tournament coming up uh, this coming weekend, which is the Big Boss, Big Shark, Florida tournament. And uh, I've already got several of my sponsors help sponsoring it. And uh, that's that's just kind of what I enjoy, man. I've gotten my sponsors involved with a, a few local people, a couple of the shops here locally. Uh, we did a cancer benefit for a local shop here. Uh, one of the guys here, uh, it's a Wee Wah Wiggler bait and tackle. Y'all be sure to go check him out. He uh, got up with us and said the a local family stage five cancer, you know, not doing well and they needed help to pay for their stuff. Again, I won't, I won't specify no names for the sake of them, but uh, I was able to reach out to a bunch of my sponsors and uh, keepers only uh, re, uh, reaction tackle, uh, FC Fish Co., which is a local guy, uh, which is Forgotten Coast Fish Company. They're great. I've done great on their bait. They helped sponsor it. And just being able to get it, I'm kind of, I don't know, the middleman. I get my sponsors involved in a lot of these local stuff that, uh, by themselves wouldn't have ever heard of it. So we helped, uh, we helped, uh, surpass what they were asking for for their, what they were looking for making for their, uh, hospital bills and i wouldn't be able to do that without the help of our sponsors which is great it's nice it's nice being able to go out and make a difference in the community like that and at the same time educate people we set up a big booth uh with all this stuff from our donations we did a raffle i brought the gear out and did like a gear walk around i had a bunch of the pictures hanging up of a bunch of the stuff we caught the mako several of the big hammers several of the big tigers so we do educational walk through on the rods and reels educational talk about the pictures of what fish they are uh tagging stuff we talked about the tagging stuff and just did a uh, uh, questionnaire thing they got to ask whatever questions they wanted and then obviously it's not all seriousness we're wanting to get people involved and in coming out there and make it worth their time of donating so i brought out a couple harnesses and we did the uh like fish and reel tug of war We'd let a couple people harness up and play tug of war, draw lines and see who can drag who so they can see how much drag that we're putting to these fish on these reels. And you'd be amazed on how many people were just dumbfounded on how much drag these reels put out and talk to them. That's why we use spotters, have somebody holding on to the back of the harness because you're like I myself, I weigh about 160 pounds and you look at 160 pounds against seven, eight, a thousand plus pounds by the books they drag me all over the place but with the right harness and the right gear man you can you can make, you can catch anything yeah yeah you can those are fun to watch the old tug of wars back and forth it, it's always it always just kind of makes me laugh it was definitely an, a, a fun thing to see. So you, you created this, and then you've been doing things on social media, and you know you've been doing the, the cool with the tournaments there. Uh, what made you decide? All right, cool. Let's put this stuff on social media, and let's start doing this uh, for everyone to see. 
again, the, the educational side of it, man. I, I love getting people involved and to reach more people. Again, uh, people think of shark fishing whenever I first got into it. It wasn't, it wasn't a big thing. It's grown substantially over the past few years. Whenever I did it, and I, again, still right now, there's not many people in my area that do it. But uh, again, I think uh, Navarre and Pensacola, you might only have five or six people that do it on a big level besides you get obviously out of towners that come down from northern states where they're like, oh, I want to catch a shark. And I mean, it's grown substantially around multiple areas, Texas being the biggest one. I think Texas has one of the hugest shark fishing kind of populations out of anywhere. And so it just got, uh, just got into it and started a little bit on Facebook and then TikTok. And then we do a little bit on YouTube. We're a little bit newer on the YouTube side and shoot. Even my personal Facebook page just turned into a content page. So I think I, I post more about the educational stuff on there. than I do my hometown truckers page. And then uh, it's just, I love getting, seeing people get excited about it. I love this. And I, I like sharing my love for this sport with other people. And it's nice seeing other people enjoy it as much as we do. I get I get several con comments and several statements and likes. And it's just, it's just nice seeing people get involved the way that they do. I, I've met so many awesome people off, off of social media. Just where I've connected with the majority of my sponsors. And uh, shoot, again, on the sponsors, man, they, they benefit a lot. Uh, again, FC Fish Co., uh, my newest sponsor, I've uh, linked up with Bats and Inter Enterprise with uh, Rain Shadow Rods. Again, super cool people. And uh, I I don't think I'd be able to do this stuff as big as I do it without the help of them. They help a lot between uh, FC Fish Co. helping with bait, uh, Williams Top Notch Tackle helping with my terminal tackle, weights, leaders, uh, that's uh, something that people don't look at when they do it. They're doing this or getting into this. The cost of it gets crazy. Like the little stuff, crimps, uh, leader line, cable, little stuff like that that people think that oh, I can just buy a rod and reel and go do this. Cutoffs exist, uh, <laughs> and with, without the right gear, I mean, there's a joke that people joke about on social media, is a uh, cheap and shark fishing don't go together, and it, it really don't. I mean, you might be able to get in cheaper stuff. You want to get a good sturdy uh, spinning setup or something like that. And even that, you're a couple hundred dollars into it quick. And it's not just the reel and rod you're getting. You got to look at leaders and hooks. And if you're going to buy pre-made leaders from a company, that's great. But that you still cost. The cost of it is going to go through a uh, line. Over time, you're going to have to get new line. Over time, you're going to lose leaders or... If you end up having to cut a hook, now you got to buy a new hook or buy another section of cable. Uh, the cost of it builds up. And uh, being sponsored definitely helps that. Being able to tag them in my social media and branch them out. Now they get more people. And I myself don't work with a company that I myself don't use. So the people that I use are people that I know I know and trust, which is it's awesome. And being involved in social media, you get to meet super cool people like that. I've met uh, Eli Glisson out of South Carolina. Super cool guy. Super cool guy. The shark and sa savage, man. And uh, he runs Salty Savage over there. And we've gotten to link up with him a few times. And we fish together quite a bit. And, again, I would have never met him if it wasn't for social media. Just the social media side of it, man. It opens up such such an expansion which it's it's mind-blowing i've talked with people from wisconsin australia i've linked up with you through social media and it's just it j opens up a whole new page of it which is awesome i love the collabing with people i've like i said i've gotten a lot of experience and i've met with people on the beach that's that day on the beach was their first time ever on the beach and then i've met with people that's done this stuff for years like i have huh yeah, we met up, met with people from France the other weekend through fishing because they seen us fishing, stopped by to ask questions and stuff. And just between the social media and just the fishing in general, man, you get to meet such awesome people. 
and people that on a day-to-day basis you would have probably not said two words about or said two words to. And it's, it's awesome, man. You get to meet with just, uh, I don't know, man. It's such, it's mind-boggling. Like, when, whenever I got into this, whenever I was a kid, and I was, I never once thought that I'd be into it the way that I am today. Meeting, I've met people from all, all over the world through fishing. It, it's it's super cool to actually think about. Like, I'm, I still feel like I'm a little guy, but not many people can say they can, they've collab with people from France or Australia or on the other side of Florida. And I meet people still to on a day to day that are mind boggled to meet me, and it's just I don't know. It's it's a crazy feeling, man. To, oh, I know I've I've seen your stuff from this and that, and people act like I'm some something special. It's like shoot, all I do is go and play with fish on a regular basis. <laughs> it's just I don't know. It's super cool, man. Social yeah. media. <laughs> it is a good thing. I mean, that's the positive side of it for sure. So you, you uh, actually. Let's do our last bait check of the episode first because it's been an hour, and then we'll get into these last questions and get you into the final questions. I didn't realize how fast time was. I looked up. I was like, oh, hey, that just happened. It is time for your third and final bait check of the episode. Hopefully, you've caught a bunch of fish today, and life's good, and you're on the way home listening to this, or you're going out, and you're already planning on it. Like I said, 20, 30 minutes is normally a good interval for a bait check. Make sure you top it off. Get a fresh one on there to go. Yeah, this bait check is being brought to you by Ninja Tackle. NinjaTackleVA.com. Go take a look at that website. Home of the Ninja Dagger series. You guys know I love them. The seven-footer. Oh, I love that thing. It's always in the car with me up to the 13 footer i've got them and i love them they're great rods i have caught a bunch of fish on them and they are definitely trustworthy rods they throw well they hold up and they're great customer service i've never had one problem with them if you need to get your hands on reels he's got plenty of ones in there conventional uh, rigs definitely all set up for different types of fishing that you could need it's a one-stop shop if you're into firearm and firearm accessories he's got you covered there with ninja tactical i can tell you more about it but uh, unfortunately the sensors don't like that so we're not going to say anything else other than if you need optics or parts they got you covered ninja tackle va.com go take a look get your order in today so running in social media that you know, like you've had the positive there we've all had the positive and the negative but let's uh let's go on to this one what has been the biggest lesson learned after running in these social media circles doing the stuff you've posted and continuing on with content uh the sensory side of thing <laughs> like you was just talking about in the bait talk it's uh it's it's bit me in the butt a couple times uh facebook and tiktok don't like certain stuff and uh it's still nothing bad, and I mean, you're always going to have your, uh, again, I, I can't say this the way that I want to say this, again, for sensory, but you have your naysayers and your people that don't approve of what we do, which is mind-boggling. Like, I mean, it's cra- crazy to think that there's still people like that, but uh, teach their own, you know, not everybody was raised the way we was, and you can't control that. But uh, I just had to say, really, that that's it. You know, between some some of the sensories, I actually just had a, a TikTok removed that I posted over, which was cr- it's crazy. And for one, it's been posted for months, and it just just got removed, which I find crazy. And uh, it was all it was was a video of a, a foul hook sandbar. I had a, fa- a video of a foul hook sandbar. It got it up. It showed my guys running down there grabbing it, pulling it up. I walked up, seen it was foul hooked, and uh, I I jiggled it loose, tossed it off to the side, and drug it out. Nothing bad at all, you know. And uh, I got notified by TikTok that it, it was removed for animal abuse. And uh, all my TikTok is is shark fishing. It's all 100%. And besides a little bit of like uh, turtle stuff, I I like playing with turtles every now and again. We'll get our alligator snapping turtles and our common snapping turtles and stuff i'm that weird guy that if i see a turtle in the road i'm stopping and i'm pulling it out out of the road uh like uh matt with fc fish co he always calls me the florida steve Irwin because <laughs> I'm, I'm always out there grabbing a hold of something but uh really that's uh that's really the only negative that i've had and i've been lucky enough to not have a whole bunch of ne- negatives on it uh most of the people that check out and follow me are usually pretty supportive of what we do. And uh, because I, I do push the educational side of it pretty pretty heavy on my social media. 
That's good of you, man. And yeah, it's it's definitely one of the the rougher side of things. So with the social media, let's get into the final bit here and get you out of here for your days to go spend with your family. What knowledge would you give to a brand new, I'm starting out today, angler? Uh, stay consistent. I mean, that's the big, biggest thing I can say. Try new stuff, experiment. Uh, don't, don't get stuck in a too much of a pattern. Uh, and consistency is key. If you're planning on doing it, even just a hobby or something you want to get into, consistent knowledge. Uh, mark your stuff down. If you catch something, mark down or write down, start your little book. What bait is working for that point in time? Uh, what leader is working for that point in time? Cool thing about pretty much any kind of fish is everything is migratory. Whatever you catch right now at this point in time, there's a good chance you're going to catch next year at that same point in time. Book your knowledge. Uh, the more stuff you can have booked, it's going to get easier. It's going to, I mean, fishing's easy. Everything's migratory. Once you learn a good pattern, you'll be able to repeat it over and over. And then you'll pretty much remove your guessing game. It's your, it's just like studying for a test, your side notes for a test back in school. Same thing works for fishing. Book your little bit of knowledge, your time frame, date season whatever little bit of information you could think of to put down you can repeat that same process over and over it takes all the guesswork out of fishing which is 90 percent of fishing is hoping and guessing once you get a couple years into it that book will benefit you so much so much nice very very well done i uh, kind of covered a bunch of the other questions there so i can basically ask you the last couple here <laughs> Loving it, man. Just made it simple. Uh, let's do the first one here. Where can people follow your fishing adventures on social media? Hometown Sharkers on TikTok. I got a Hometown Sharkers on Facebook also. And then Travis Lucas, which is my personal page on Facebook, I post the most on there. Uh, Travis Lucas 76 on Snapchat. Uh, you'll get a lot of my pre-posts on there because i'll post as it's happening on my snapchat and uh i think uh you can search it up i think it's little trav 850 is how you would search it up on snapchat and then uh the travis lucas 76 also on tiktok or hometown sharkers so either one of those that should pull up the uh tiktok account and I do Instagram also. Travis or Hometown Sharker is also on Instagram. It's not posted as consistent, but a lot of the guys that support me on there post for me. So you'll see a lot of tags and stuff that pop up on my Instagram. And uh, yeah, or YouTube also. Hometown Shark, uh, Hometown Shark, Hometown Shark Adventures on YouTube. And all of that will be linked back on FindingDemoSurfishing.com. Under the information of this episode, it'll also be on the Transistor homepage. So you can link up on all those and make sure you're following uh, Travis on that whole one and the team. All right. Uh, second to last question for you is, who's the sponsors that you have? All right. Sponsors I have to shout out to is uh, Batson Enterprise. They're awesome, man. Best, best rod you can get. They do custom rod blanks. I mean, hop on them. They're why, why go through a rod a year when you can get a rod that lasts you a lifetime? Uh, FC Fish Co. They're local to here here in Florida, Forgotten Coast Fish Company. They do an all-natural shrimp bait and liver bait for you freshwater guys. It's all naturally salt-preserved with added scent to it. Uh, we'll have to say Reaction Tackle, their line, uh, top tier. And why, why pay hundreds of dollars for line when you can get something just as good for a little bit and also i got um, my code uh ps15 off that's it that has saved you some cash on there too keepers only co man uh again the hat they're freaking awesome they've sponsored several events for us they do all fishing apparel and uh code for them is the shark guy all capital letters they're uh keepers only uh company the Williams Top Notch Tackle. Leaders, weights, man. I guarantee they can be anybody else on their shipping. Super quick. You order it. I've, I've had them get it to me in two days because I've had a tur tournament coming up. 
uh, St. Joe Shrimp Company. Again, a local sh- company here. They do uh, local seafood and bait. Freaking phenomenal people. And uh, I think I think that's it. <laughs> uh, well, We Wall Wiggler Bait and Tackle. They're here in We Wall, Hitchcock, Florida. Super awesome people. Uh, family owned. Su- super great. They're all they're all su- super great companies. That's excellent, man. Great job on all those ones. So, I mean, we pretty much nailed into the entire episode here. Let's get into the last question. What's next for you? I mean, uh, better and improve, man. Uh, I'd like to get a little bit bigger on my social media. I think I'm up to uh, 45 or 4,600 people on Facebook. I'm pushing two grand on TikTok. I'd like to get more followers on my TikTok. I do great on my uh, interactions and my likes. I think I'm almost 50,000 likes on my TikTok. Wow. But under 2,000 followers. So I'd like for my following to pick up on there quite a bit. But ain't nothing I can do for that. If people don't smash the follow button there, I can't make them smash the follow button. (laughs) People are loving the content because, I mean, I see people with 50,000 followers that's not got 40 plus thousand likes. So I'd, li- I'd like the people to start following the TikTok more. And uh, I plan on doing a, little, a few more travel trips. Uh, like I said, we got the tournament coming up this weekend for Florida. We're working on, I want to do a Texas trip. I want to do an East Coast trip, South Carolina. We got a, quite, quite a few little things in the works for this coming uh, couple years. So a little, little bit more travel stuff. Uh, new PBs, you know, the basic stuff and uh, just a lot more information, man. I'm, I'm huge on the educational stuff. I got a few more species I want to knock out that might might be coming soon. And yeah, uh, I feel like, I feel like that's that's really it just to improve. I want to better what we do and get knock out a few more travel trips and uh, yeah. just grow, grow more. Just keep on keeping on. Keep on. That's all you can do ever, right? <laughs> uh, it's good stuff, man. Travis, I thank you, man. Seriously, I, I really appreciate you spending the time with me this morning. You know, I know I messed you last week. Uh, we were supposed to record, and I screwed that up. And thank you for being patient and coming back on. Uh, I'm excited, man. I'm excited to see the content that you keep on doing and all the fun things that you're going to keep building on. I think you got a long, cool career ahead of you, and I think you're going to nail it and rock it out of the park, man. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, and I, I get it. Things happen. We get busy, too. Uh, it would have been cool last week because, you know, we was on the beach, and that we caught the that tiger shark in, within the time frame that we would have been on the podcast. <laughs> Interesting. But, hey, it happens. I, life gets busy sometimes, so it's, it's cool. It's better. Well, it's better. You weren't distracted. Oh, yeah. I, it would have been cool to do the interview while hooked up to that thing. Though. That would have been <laughs> I look forward to doing it again. Uh, this is definitely, definitely cool. We'll definitely have to talk again about it sometime. Uh, definitely, man. All right. You take care of yourself. We'll talk soon. You too. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So there you go. We've had a great conversation with hometown sharkers, Travis Lucas. It was a good episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you picked up some good knowledge. Keep doing the good things you are. You know, appreciate you always coming back here to check out Finding Demo Surf Fishing. Uh, everything will be linked back on findingdemosurffishing.com, and you can take a look and listen and then go back and link up with all the stuff that uh, Travis said. We'll all be hyperlinked back there, and you can follow him in all his adventures. You've been listening to Finding Demo Surf Fishing. I'm out of here. <laughs>